Welcome to Three Tiny Questions. Three Tiny Questions with Jason Victoris, VP of Marketing at Uncommon. That's Lab Grown Pork. Welcome to Three Tiny Questions, the podcast where we, three tiny partners, ask the leading minds in marketing one question each about brands, trends, culture, and whatever else comes into our crazy heads in an effort to make the world of advertising a tiny bit smarter. I'm Tom Chrisman, partner at Tiny, an ad agency devoted to making great work with great people and having a great time doing it. And with me, as always, are two great people, my partners, Mike Robner and Michael Stupak. Say hey, you tiny illuminaries. Hello. Hey. Oh, sorry. I didn't follow instructions. Hey, our guest today was the global chief strategy officer of Crispin Porter and Bogusky, caught a 10 pound tuna, took his nephew to the pet store, once pretended to be his own twin brother. He is the best strategist I've ever worked with. And now he's the vice president of marketing at Uncommon. He is Jason DeTouris. Welcome, Jason. I have a question that's not one of the three tiny questions. This is an unofficial question. When you pretended to be your own twin brother, was there already a twin brother? Or were you pretending that there is a twin brother and then you became said twin brother? Uh, I pretended I was Justin. Yeah, so I grew, up on, I grew up on Long Island and Long Island's pretty rough. Who, did, who didn't? So yeah, who didn't? His name was Michael. I'm not going to give him any more credit than that. It, it was pretty much avoiding a fight in the in the boys' room, and I basically was like, "I'm not Jason. I don't <laughs> like Jason either." <laughs> so, that's fucking brilliant! Uh, wow, that's where the strategy starts. <laughs> that's brilliant. I wish that I was genius. Heard. Yeah, I love how uh, Stupak turned this game. This is into a game show almost. Like, yeah, like, right. like he's he's put these like little little uh, red herrings and canards into his into his interests. And now I'm like, wait, I need to know about the cousin, uh, the nephew and the pet star. Why'd you do that? Stupak? Yeah. That's not my question. <laughs> this is what you get for sending over your fact sheet. <laughs> Welcome Jason. Hello, New York and beyond. Good to see you guys. Mike, you want to kick him off? Rovner, oh, you're, uh, you're I line. do, I do. I was it's just in this you. like Smartless, where it's just a terrible interview, but we're going to have fun anyway. That's oh, exactly. yeah. Preview, oh, yeah. Interview question. You've, you've nailed it. All right. We all are right. basically ripping off Smartless. Well, and, uh, Stu Pack is no. the one we all make fun of. Legally. Uh, yeah, yeah legally, I, no. We all think we're Will Arnett. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in reality, we're all Sean. All right. Well, normally, Jason, we start by uh, asking our luminaries, uh, which you'd be one of, to um, just tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get to this place where you find yourself a guest on this, these three tiny questions? Um, well, you find me today in Cambridge, England. So I don't know if that's part of the, the story here, but I moved here about eight months ago to take on a, a marketing and product leadership role at a startup. And I have to say, I grew up in New York, so right around the corner from where you guys probably are. And the distance between has been a great journey of really understanding, um, I think, what strategy and culture mean to like change fortunes and build brands and do fun things. and. I've really, I've been able to travel the world because I started on Madison Avenue. So maybe not a condensed answer, but this is where no, you find it. That's where I started. You'd be surprised how long those answers can be. <laughs> it's time for question one. Um, Jason, you're a strategist, right? Maybe. <laughs> is that that's question? not my question. That's, that's not, not my question. question. <laughs> right. Uh, what is strategy? And I think a lot of marketers, you know, they're, they're, it's thrown around a lot. You know, there's, there's creative strategists, there's, uh, there's business strategists, there's, uh, planners, there's all kinds of names for strategists. Why is strategy so important to the creative process? And what happens when, you know, clients, agencies, creatives jump directly to execution instead of starting in strategy? Um, I used to, uh, 
I used to describe strategy as like the dark arts. So let's start there, which is strategy is really defining a problem and finding just maybe the most um, unexpected route to a solution. First of all, strategy in a vacuum is not a strategy. So you have to understand culture, commerce, um, your customer, your consumer, all the obvious things, but it really comes from collaboration and your team trying to solve this problem, how you define the most interesting strategy. And I used to tell people, you have to have a strategy for your strategy, which I know sounds confusing, but it's, if you're going to do something really bold, you've got to figure out how you're going to sell that. Um, and so I have a random maybe story and you can cut around it, but years ago at Crispin, we were pitching hotels.com and Andrew Keller, who's creative and was our CEO at the time. Um, we were talking about how, when that company was born, you would buy URLs that were just very generic and obvious, like hotels.com, right? This is where you go to find hotels. And that company lasted 20 years, but they were being challenged immensely and there was nothing special about the name. And I remember him joking, saying like, what if we go in and recommend they change the name? And so I went with it. I said, all right, strategically, how do I make that a good idea? And we started to talk about how different people look for different hotels. I have a dog and I need a hotel that has a dog. And he jokingly said, what if we made it, I sleep with dogs.com, jokingly. And I said, there's a good strategy there because you can then have the whole company reframe itself as being individualistic to every, um, every type of traveler. And we went into the chemistry meeting with that idea, which they should have laughed us out of the room, but because it was reinventing and saying, your name's generic, Here's how we can personalize your offering, which is quite strong to everyone in every different traveler household need. We made it to the second round. And then we went in and said, that was a terrible idea. You have the most obvious name. And then we, we came up with Captain Obvious and then we introduced that, which lasted eight to 10 years. But strategy is um, creativity with fact. And I think creativity with outcomes attached to it, but it doesn't have to be sterile. People think of strategy as left brain and data and numbers. And it's actually when you take a creative leap in a strategy, that's why I call it the dark arts, you can unlock so many different great opportunities that will resonate in culture, that will break through, that will be memorable. So many of the great agencies, and Crispin is one of the great agencies, um, have these strategists who are so tied to the creative teams. And I love that story because it shows that strategy isn't a thing you just do and get out and check the box. Okay, we did the strategy. Strategy is a ongoing conversation between creative people and business people. And um, And I love, the other thing I love is that you said the first thing is defining the problem, which I think a lot of people never do. Because they they either don't want to because they're like, well, that we can't talk about that problem. You know, the CEO or the board isn't going to approve that problem because that's saying the, the quiet thing out loud. Uh, and like defining the problem is so important. And I love that answer. Talk yeah. That. And I, I like how you say it, saying the quiet thing out loud. That's the, like no one. I don't think people really care about advertising and marketing. Right. So you no. have to make them care. And if you don't mm -hmm. say the quiet thing out loud, then it passes like a ship in the night. Well, nobody cares. And we, we talk about this in our class all the time, and it's nothing you don't know, or our audience doesn't know, but nobody cares about your brand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they care about themselves, clearly. Everybody does. And if their brand can do something for them, great, then they care. Um, so we appreciate you, you strategists out there, all of you. Um, I think it's my turn to ask a question. So Yay. Question. it's time for question two. You, you already talked about Captain Obvious, which has obviously been around for a long time, or it was. Um, what's the one campaign, let's say it's not that one, that you're most proud of because you had it? You nailed that strategy. You know, you had that aha moment 
that led to the creative having the aha moment. Um, we've all experienced it in different ways and different times. But for you, is there one that just you know comes to mind? Um, well, let's campaign. Campaigns sometimes are like thin and ephemeral, right? But one of my favorite projects was a strategy that led to product development and then the creative would be working on Papa's Pilar, which at that point was an unnamed rum brand for the Hemingway family. So um, I had come from JWT where I worked with Michael to Crispin and there was like this uh, secret brief or something. It was called Fancy and it was meant to create a premium rum for the Hemingway family. And my favorite aspect of that project was we started with what are we not going to do? Like strategically, we said, we're not going to put Hemingway's face on the bottle because that's lazy and that's not about the spirit of Hemingway. So the strategy started with like deep, deep understanding of how complex he was, um, his relationship with travel and adventure and spirits. And the strategy tried to summarize him as not being a spectator. And so that then led to the bottle being designed as his uh, canteen from when he was a journalist in World War. It led to um, copy lines like um, the world's large, life is short, Godspeed. You know, it just, it's, it just fueled an ethos. And I still get little nice messages from the investors and founders of that company that, you know, it's still, it's a thriving brand. They have never a spectator is still on the bottle. There's a distillery in Key West. Like it, the strategy and, and the team that worked on that strategy really dimensionalized it. So the other piece that maybe I'm, I should mention is when you look at premium rums or rums, usually you want to put an umbrella in the drink and it's about summer and vacation. So the tension was really about rum is for relaxing, but Hemingway's rum is for adventure. It, it was amazing. I got to present to his son and Bozeman, Patrick Hemingway. And at wow. the end of that, with the team, uh, Patrick said, I wish as many people that wrote books about my father did as much research as you did. It's time for question three. Yeah, all right. I'm gonna shift gears. Jason, you and I were talking a bit about culture, company culture, right? So you've worked at a number of agencies. You're now at your second client side role, your second startup. Um, so you've been at places that were global, regional, big, small, old, and like you're talking about now, brand spanking new, all presumably with their own cultures. So what have you, you know, come to learn and appreciate about the impact of company culture on its own fortunes, its outputs, its people? Yeah, I, that's an amazing question. I think, I hope everyone asks that question when they're joining a company or starting a company. I think it's it's the most important thing. Um, and I know we're gonna cut a little bit earlier, we're talking about farming, but culture is soil, right? So culture and soil are the same thing. How rich it is really depends on what you put into it and then what you get out of it. So- I told you how good he was. This is how good he is. I, um, so I, I have an anecdote, Michael, which I, I think I touched on with you, but um, so working at OV or JWT or even Deutsch in New York for eight to 10, 12 years, we we're working on Fortune 100 companies. And as a strategist on those teams, it was very competitive, but it was very siloed in, you know, it was top down meta, whoever I was working for or with and defining that strategy. And then I moved to Boulder, Colorado, where the strategy group was um, a really diverse mix of journalists, cultural anthropologists, a couple weirdos, a futurist, and traditional strategists like myself. And I realized that instead of everyone focusing on their own lane or, or brand, everyone was very open about 
what brief they had, what problem they were trying to solve. And they were very open in sharing and asking questions. And um, that, that was a very different shift versus I'm going to work today in Manhattan and I'm going to solve this myself for myself, for this client versus being vulnerable and exploratory and open. And so, and it was a cliche, so like I escaped the matrix, but like that shift opened me up to now all those perspectives and, and to allow people at junior or senior levels to share openly in that environment is cultural. And that became such a indicator of how you were gonna get to the best idea and that I've taken that forward into large, small, new companies. And so for me, the most important thing outside of like what's on your job title is how you create culture. So I may be a head of marketing or lead product, but every day I go to work, job one for me is, you know, does everyone feel like they can share and be vulnerable and you know, does this person's idea make it to the center of the table or is what this person's struggling with get discussed and debated because that's how you get to the best ideas. It's like a generator where these um, these things are bouncing off each other. And I, I feel like early in my career, it was very individualistic, which makes no sense. You know, so how do you breed these cultures where and I know it's been said a million times, a good idea comes from anywhere. Well, it, it can't come from anywhere if you make people feel small or insecure in sharing those things, whether they're good ideas or challenges. So I think encourage, you have to bring inspiration in and encourage people to share. And that's where all the great stuff comes from. You build on ideas. So true, so true. Yeah, hundred percent. You gonna ask a question? Look, you're like gonna you're gonna I follow up the mute button, but you I uh, no, I was just gonna tell you you were wrong about how you grow a culture. It's a, it's a it's a petri dish, but it was too long to he wait. Knows that joke, so it's fucking ruined now, and I don't even want to. What talk he's doing every day? He gets very upset about growing things. Well, that's all we've got for three tiny questions. We are your hosts, the tiny team of Tom Chrisman, Michael Stupak, and me, Mike Rovner. Check us out at tinyadagency.com or all over your LinkedIn feeds. And tune in next time and send us your biggest marketing questions and you could find yourself featured on three tiny questions. Stay tiny, everyone. Stay tiny indeed. Mm -hmm.